Hello there, Alaskans, wherever you are. Welcome to the Must Read Alaska Show. Coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. This is the place where we talk about, you guessed it, Alaska. Where we keep the mainstream media on their toes and where we are standing up for what's right and a world run by leftists. You can find out more by heading over to mustreadalaska.com and also checking out the Must Read Alaska YouTube channel for some really great content. But first, let's get this party started. Merry Christmas, Alaska, and welcome to a special edition of Must Read Alaska show coming to you from somewhere in Alaska. And I'm Suzanne Downing. Scott Levesque is also with me as my co-host today. And he's got that deep radio voice that you are accustomed to hearing on Wednesdays. So Scott, let's do a mic check on you. You there? I'm here. Yeah, ready to go. Sounding great. And we have a special guest with us today. So I really appreciate you letting me sort of butt in onto your show, which is always the Wednesday show. We have Governor Mike Dunleavy on our show today, and we put up a little post on Facebook earlier so that everybody would know to tune in this evening. Uh, Governor Dunleavy, welcome to the Must Read Alaska show. Uh, it's great to be on, Suzanne and Scott. Thanks for having me, and um, um, you know, we're getting ready for Christmas and a New Year's. Yes, Merry Christmas to you, and how is, uh, what are you and First Lady Rose Dunleavy doing for Christmas? Are you staying home? We're staying home. Uh, we uh, we enjoy having a white Christmas, and uh, we anticipate that we'll some of our two at least two out of three daughters will be there. Uh, uh, one other may be um, up north, uh, Red Dog Mine, but we uh, we're looking forward to it, and um, it's just the time to unwind a little bit for a day or two. Oh my gosh, and and you deserve it. Hey, we're really glad to have you on our show. Here's we're on the eve 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 of Christmas. And it's feeling really crispy, Christmassy outside with all this snow. I know that over in Bethel, they've got a bunch of rain pouring down and it's uh, it's pretty dreary over there. But here on the rail belt, it's uh, it's definitely a white Christmas. We wanted to jump right into some topics that, uh, that we outlined earlier, I believe, on the phone. We just talked a little briefly about, uh, you know, the things that you expect for this coming year. And you've got a pretty big lift ahead of you in 2022. I wanted to first go over with you your public safety initiative. Now, you signed the repeal of SB 91 as soon as you got into office, pretty much. I mean, you, you, you signed, I think it was SB 49 or HB 49. Yes. Yes, and um, and made that terrible bill go away. And you've been working on uh, public safety initiatives ever since. Can you talk about uh, a little bit about this People First initiative that you have? Because I am pretty excited about this, and I want to be the first person to have a button that says People First. By the way, yeah, no, thank you. So, you know, one of the one of the uh, major um, planks of the campaign when I ran was to uh, ensure that uh, Alaska was as safe as we can possibly make it. And we know that we have some serious issues with uh, domestic abuse, sexual assault, um, and uh, uh, we, we were determined to, to turn things around to the best of our ability. So when we came into office, SB 91 was in place. And if you remember, uh, it, I don't think a day went by in which there wasn't a, a headline somewhere that said another car stolen, more uh, tools stolen off of a trailer, uh, construction sites, things are stolen. We, we had people guarding their homes, putting more... Uh, 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 lights in their 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 uh, their backyards, uh, locking their doors, which they didn't do before, locking their cars, parking their cars in a certain place. Really, the criminals had the uh, good people on the run, and we said, "This is crazy. We're not. Well, this is enough is enough." So when we got in, with the help of the legislature on this issue, we were able to repeal SB ninety one. So where are we today? We our crime rates. With the exception of sexual assault, we'll talk about that in a moment, our crime rates are, are down tremendously. Car thefts are down about 37%. Uh, burglaries down. Most of our metrics that we measure crime down. This is, in, uh, this is, in, uh, 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 this is a change from what happened uh, in the previous administration where crime rates were going up. Our crime rates are going down, continue to go down. This is also different than what's happening across the country. As you know, some of our big cities, the, uh, the politicians allowed their cities to be looted, burned, all kinds of mayhem. It didn't happen here. Alaska was one of only two states where there was no lootings, no shootings, no burnings, no riots, no gla glass breaking. Um, we really support our men and women in blue here. It's like yeah. we support our military here. 
And so although we've got a, a, a very sad and stubborn sexual abuse, domestic violence issue here in Alaska, the crime rates are going down. So the People First initiative is really focusing on that particular issue, uh, sexual assault, domestic violence. We've got to protect the most vulnerable uh, here in the state of Alaska. And so what, what is, what's going to entail, what, what, what will be entailed uh, uh, with that is uh, the approach is going to have more resources going into it. We're going to have more troopers, more VPSOs. We're going to stand up uh, strike teams out in Western Alaska. Um, you know, another thing I forgot to mention was the sexual assault kits and the DNA, uh, the DNA uh, cataloging. Uh, no, let's talk about that for a minute because because yeah. you've got those all that backlog cleared now. And to, and what does that mean when we say we have the backlog cleared? It means thousands of cases that we've had for many 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 years uh, were were up to date on them. They're all they've all been processed, um, uh, being cataloged, and so we don't have a backlog which we've had for years. It was it was commonly accepted, unfortunately, that we may or may not get to these kits, which could help bring justice to victims. And so we said, well, we're not gonna do this anymore. We're going to focus on making sure that those kits are processed across the board. And um, right now we're in great shape, we're up to date, and um, we're gonna continue to be on top of that. Uh, our, our goal is not to have a police state in the state of Alaska, but at the same time, no, no woman or man, no child should grow up thinking, you know what, I'm probably gonna, I'm probably gonna become a victim of sexual assault or domestic violence. It shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be a, a norm. It shouldn't be accepted. It shouldn't be baked into Alaska's uh, psyche. And so we're gonna do everything we can over the next few years to make sure that Alaska drives down its cases uh, of sexual assault and domestic violence. And um, as a result, we may see more people going to prison. Uh, we're gonna have more prosecutors, more troopers, more VPSOs, more strike teams. And uh, we're gonna keep working on it. At the same time, we're gonna be working on um, uh, an initiative on missing and murdered indigenous women, uh, as, as well as other uh, missing individuals in the state of Alaska. Families, the victims, uh, everybody, Alaska needs to make sure that justice occurs in these cases. So we're going to find out where these people are. We're going to find out um, what had what happened to them, and we're going to bring anybody that has victimized these individuals to justice. And the other thing I would say, Suzanne, if you remember, we've had a number of cold cases cracked under this administration over the last couple of years, and that's due in part to the fact that we uh, were focused on those. Uh, technology has helped us. And so we've brought some closure to some families and um, we've got some folks that um, are now uh, facing charges and will be going to trial uh, for their part in the um, unfortunate um, uh, murders of some of these individuals. And so, you know, I said in my first state of the state speech, if you're gonna come to Alaska, if you're gonna be, in a, if you're gonna be a criminal in Alaska, we're gonna, you're gonna be on the run. And <laughs> we've, we've been true to that. And we're gonna continue to tighten down on those criminals and at the same time, uh, protecting Alaskans and solving some of these cases. This is really good news. And so anybody who um, is out there who is the parent of a, of a daughter or a grandparent of a daughter, this is really good news because one of the things that is heartbreaking is to know that we have to tell our daughters you know, how to be careful and that, um, that there are predators out there. And it sounds like we're going to, over the next year, probably see some of these rape kits. They're not just now processed, but there is DNA behind them that can track down some of the perpetrators. And if there are perpetrators out there, it, you, you remind me of what you said in your first day of the state speech. Um, you, you know, you're in the wrong state. You better leave because we're coming for you. Yep. So, uh, Scott, uh, I know you, you're um, with us on, you're, as my co-host today. Appreciate you so much. Do you have any questions for the governor? Yeah, well, number one, governor, I appreciate the fact that, uh, again, you're putting public safety initiatives at the forefront. That is huge. But there's other things I know that you're looking at as well. And one of those is port funding, in particular, making sure that we have, I guess I'll title it resilient infrastructure, a way to make sure that we're not piecemealing, but everything is is really resilient. It's it's together. And can you talk a little bit about what you're looking at when it comes to funding the ports and making sure that uh, we are prepared, whether it's for the next earthquake or a supply chain issue, generally speaking? 
Yeah, great, great question, Scott. I mean, I don't know. I, I think most people felt the earthquake yesterday. We were in the yeah. Atwood building and we had a bit of a, you know, a, a swing there with the uh, going back and forth with the building. But nonetheless, uh, earthquakes are common here in Alaska and the port is incredibly important to um, much of the rail belt going from the Kenai um, north to the slope. And so it's essential that the ports in South Central Alaska um, are in good shape, can handle uh, growing, uh, hopefully growing cargo. Right now we've got uh, issues on both, uh, uh, actually a few ports. Um, so the port of Anchorage obviously needs work, a lot of work. Right, uh, just a stone's throw away, you've got the port at Point Mac, and we've got to make sense of what we want um, our ports in South Central to look like uh, so that they're not competing against each other, so that hopefully there's a complement, uh, a complementary approach to that. So we're not fighting over funds, we're not fighting over uh, customers. So we're, we're looking forward to sitting down with uh, officials and uh, those that use the ports as to how we go about making sure that we have a, a port approach that makes sense for Alaska. It doesn't cost us a ton of money and um, stops any uh, potential, uh, you know, fighting over funds and fighting over resources. We have uh, other ports in Anchorage, right? We know that we've got Whittier, we've got Seward. We've got, uh, we've got a number of ports here in South Central as well as across the state. So we're, we're, we're gonna be sitting down with those individuals, um, officials, and customers to, to come up with an approach to the ports that will get the ports in, in shape, get the ports to where they need to be for the next five, 10, 15, 20, 25 years, to be able to handle increasing cargo, both coming into the state of Alaska and being exported from the state of Alaska. It's absolutely crucial. This is a, this is, this is a high priority for my administration. No, I think you, you nailed it. Supply chain is specifically, we are a state that relies on that heavily uh, particularly from the lower 48. Uh, another thing I wanted to ask you is sort of a reflectory question here in this forms of sustainability. When we look at sort of what the pandemic brought, we realized, I think, once again, sometimes we can forget that Alaskans are pretty resilient and that a lot of things we had to do on our own. We had a lot of things that we had to look at, some things that we needed to uh, be able to do on our own. And I was wondering if maybe you could talk a little bit about maybe the sustainability of both in agriculture um, and what that looks like in terms of maybe even updates and some of uh, in our upgrades to like electrical systems and whatnot. What did what did the pandemic in that process kind of reveal to us, both in the positive as Alaskans, but also some things that were like, you know what, we should probably address some of these things. Yeah, great question. What it showed me is that it's just not theoretical that we could be cut off. I mean, we were cut off. The Canadians prevented us from going over land. The CDC and the Canadians prevented us from uh, using our cruise ships uh, for, for, for tourism. Uh, we had demand destruction in flights. In other words, less and less people were flying. And in some cases, um, some of the cargo planes early on, uh, we had to restrict uh, 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 pilots, et cetera. And so we also had an issue where there was talk about the port of Seattle closing down because early on Seattle was impacted by this virus. This would have been devastating to the state of Alaska. And what it does is it kind of wakes you up. It kind of wakes you up to the fact that in the end, if, if things really fall apart, we are on our own. We're 730,000 people at the top of the world. Um, we are American, but we're still on our own. And so what it, uh, what it had a number of us do is really reassess our ability to take care of ourselves. We're lucky that we have uh, oil and gas. We're lucky that we can process that oil and gas. We're lucky that we have minerals. We have, we have lots, of, uh, lots of trees to be able to uh, potentially make paper and lumber. Um, but there's some, th these things we have to strengthen, but we also have to grow our agricultural sector. That became pretty apparent. Um, because if we're gonna be dependent on getting food in from thousands of miles away, um, that's an iffy situation in a pandemic or some other catastrophe. And so what I've instructed our administration to do is look at how we can grow this agricultural sector, grow the processing aspect of uh, agriculture, and, and really set up a system in which we have food security. I have to give credit to uh, uh, former Governor Parnell because this is one of his, is his issues, to have uh, individual Alaskans and communities prepared for uh, the possibility of some catastrophe. Regardless of whether it's going to be a pandemic that impacts the entire state or regional issues such as earthquakes or floods or fires, which we have in Alaska frequently, 
we really have to stand up and strengthen our food security approach. We really have to stand up and strengthen our agriculture approach. Um, we have a number of agricultural projects in the state of Alaska, Point Mac. Uh, we have some uh, long-standing farms in the valley by Palmer and Wasilla. We have uh, a farming community out by Kenny Lake, Delta up by Fairbanks. We are starting a 160-acre, 160, 160,000-acre agricultural project now up by Nenana. We believe that uh, if, if we grow this base uh, and we can supply Alaska, it's also a jumping off point to really export, uh, export foodstuffs to Asia because we are the closest state to Asia by far. And with growing populations in China uh, and, and the, uh, Korea, and th these, these, uh, these countries are looking to the West to supply them with more Western food, we have a real opportunity. So you'll hear more about what we're doing with agriculture. We are um, in the process of um, um, uh, trying to get a couple bills passed in which we could put land in the hands of Alaskans, both agricultural lands and also uh, small sites for recreational uh, cabins. So you're gonna hear more about this. We're gonna be, uh, we're gonna be working with uh, various groups throughout Alaska to make sure that uh, we, start, we embark upon a, uh, a, um, a, an initiative to make sure that we can take care of ourselves going forward with regard to foodstuffs. Well, there may be a role, Governor, in, for the University of Alaska to actually jump in a little bit more on the food security piece because uh, farming in Alaska is, you know, it's just a, it's, it's a tricky thing. And down in Southeast, the soil is so darn acidic and it's also steep. And um, in, in some places in Alaska, there's just so much permafrost. So that we do have places where we can do it. There's there's a lot of things you could do with some um, high tunnel farming that could be done in Alaska successfully, but it seems like the university might have a role. And there might be some other things that the university can work on for us as well. And I know that you have um, you signed a compact with them a few years ago, three years ago to, you know, it was a budget reduction because we needed the budget to come down in every, in every area of the state. We need the budget to come down because we're out of money. But at this point, um, it's they've they've re sort of evaluated what they're doing and they're working on programs I believe that are more core to the mission of of the economy in Alaska. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're seeing with the university in in the next coming year? Yeah, thank you. And so um, the university uh, we've been having discussions with the university now for some time and. Um, you know, I'm, I'm happy to announce that um, they've got a number of, I think, very, very exciting initiatives. One is uh, uh, they're embarking upon the, uh, the quest to be the, uh, the drone capital of the United States. Drone technology, um, unmanned aircraft, uh, possibly underwater uh, uh, craft as well. And so we, um, we decided that in our budget, we want to help them become the drone capital of this uh, country. We believe that with the airspace that we have and the small populations, this would be a great place to test drones, to uh, develop the technology for drones, both civilian and military approach. I mean, obviously we're close to, uh, to the Russians. Uh, the drone technology can also help with surveillance of uh, ships coming through the um, Arctic Ocean down the Bering Strait. And so we think it's a, a terrific fit. And, we, and with our, with our, uh, our um, a rocket uh, launching program in Kodiak, as well as Poker Flats, these things can all be tied together, I think, to make uh, Alaska and the University of Alaska a center for this type of te technology. We've also, um, we've also agreed with the university that uh, uh, there should be funding for heavy oil technology. We have billions of barrels of heavy oil on the slope, and um, we are uh, working with them to create technologies that would unleash this oil so we could get more of that oil into the pipeline as well. And of course, our uh, critical elements, our rare earths. Alaska has probably more rare earths than just about any other place in the world. And knowing what the demand is gonna be for the new technologies that are gonna rely on more electrical vehicles and electronics, it's just, it's another natural fit to make sure that we can uh, understand how we can uh, process those elements how can we, can we turn them into a uh, value-added product here in Alaska as opposed to shipping them over to China to be processed? Um, a whole host of initiatives associated with rare earths we're gonna be working with the university on. So there's a number of things our university can do that will benefit all of Alaska. We've kind of identified a few of them that we're going to help fund because again, we've got to be relying upon ourselves. We can't rely on others. 
And um, we have a real opportunity, I think, uh, uh, to, to, to really advance some of these technologies through the university that will benefit not just Alaska, but this country as a whole. So this is really news to me about this drone uh, program and wanting to become the drone capital of the world. There is no reason why we couldn't do that because we have so much airspace to work with. And um, it, it really dovetail, dovetails in well with our military here. So very interesting. You know I'm going to be working on a story on that. I'm also going to be working on a story on public safety because I think there's a lot uh, to be told there that, that uh, I need to go over. But speaking of uh, the university oil and oil and gas, I know that uh, they could be the university could be doing some more research with heavy oil. We've got a lot of opportunity with heavy oil still in our state. And that uh, that oil and gas in general, I mean, it's sort of a mixed bag for us right now because we're fighting the Biden administration so hard. We're fighting them on Anwar. And mean, meanwhile, we're also fighting them on NPRA. And uh, and yet I, I think that our oil production is coming back. I know that in 2013, seems that we were projecting, you know, 300 to 400,000 barrels a day. We're, we're at out 500,000 barrels a day. So uh, what are we doing to to fight against the the Biden administration without provoking them so much that they shut everything down? Well, they're, they're trying to shut everything down, Lindsay, and that's the problem. As soon as they got in office, uh, they uh, they began to uh, work at making sure that we didn't have off, offshore oil leases for sale. Anwar, uh, they're trying to roll back Anwar. Um, you know, the courts have also uh, dealt us a blow when it comes to the Willow Project. All of these things, if, if Alaska was left to its own devices, again, I think we, um, we develop oil better than any other place on the planet. We don't flare our oil. We don't, um, excuse me, we don't flare our gas. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we, we probably uh, have less of a footprint on the landscape than most other places that want to produce oil. If we're left to produce our own oil, we could probably be at six or 700,000 barrels of oil right now uh, if uh, we get Willow online and Pika online and others online. And so, Kaparik and Prudhoe were the big guys for a very long time, but we always knew that there were other fields up there, smaller, but a lot of other fields, a lot of oil. And um, again, I think it's somewhat bizarre that the Biden administration is begging the Saudis and the Russians to produce more oil while shutting oil production down in the United States. This does not help America. This does not help with our national security. This does not help with providing jobs, wealth. Um, it makes no sense at all. I think the Biden administration is gonna to start to come around to this sooner than later, but the fact of the matter is, it makes no sense to shut down Arctic production of oil and gas in Alaska. We're just a few miles away. The Russians are, are, are going gangbusters on developing their oil and gas. And we all know that their environmental regulations are nothing compared to ours. So this is what I've always said to people on the environmental side of things. If you truly believe in the, uh, saving the environment, do it here in Alaska, where we can keep an eye on it and protect the environment. And by doing it here in Alaska, you don't have to worry about it over there where they're gonna wreck the environment. So we get all the benefits by doing it here, including protecting our environment and protecting environments overseas. So we're gonna to continue to fight the, um, the Biden administration. Uh, Alaska is a resource state. Oil and gas is a cornerstone. And, um, um, where, where they're wrong, we'll file suit. And that's what we're doing. And that's, uh, you know, we have a state defense approach that we instituted last year. We've asked the uh, legislature for uh, money to stand up a legal team and fight back against this administration in Washington when we believe what they're doing is wrong and illegal. So we have a number of court cases going through. We signed up with a court case in Louisiana early on on offshore oil leases, and we won that case. So we anticipate that uh, there's, a, there's a chance we'll win a few more of these cases and be able to get some of these projects hopefully back online. Yeah, especially Willow, because Willow is a, is a huge project and Pika as well. And um, we, we just, uh, we're getting that 7% decline in our pipeline. And so the fact that we have gone from 487,000 barrels a day to over, you know, we're gonna be over 500,000, probably 522 in 2022. That means we've really, overcome a huge hurdle already. We had to come up from the 7% decline and then, and then put a lot more oil in the, in the pipeline. And all that, of course, is subject to royalties and, and going into the, um, the permanent fund. So I wanted to talk about the permanent fund, if you have a minute here. Um, supplemental, uh, we've got a supplemental PFD in your 2022 uh, supplemental budget. Uh, it's, the, it's the rest of the PFD that the, the legislature did not award. 
And it seems to me that just six months ago, they were arguing over this and they said, boy, anything more than $1,000 is just um, undoable. It'll just ruin the state. Well, that didn't really seem to bear out, did it? No, you actually have some people in the legislature that believe there shouldn't be a POP at all. Some, some believe there should be $500 and nothing more. Look, over the past couple of years, uh, government has done really well. The permanent fund is doing really well. Um, our pension uh, obligation, the gap uh, in our pension has been closed by billions of dollars. So we really don't have a pension gap. The price of oil has been doing well. This year, you know, when I came into office, we had a $1.6 billion deficit that was handed to us. This year, we're going to have a, a surplus. Um, so who benefits from this? Should it just be the government benefiting this or the people of Alaska? The people of Alaska are now confronted with inflation because of supply chain issues. Um, gasoline, fuel, oil, food is all going up. And we just, we believe once again that the permanent fund and the permanent fund dividend really belong to the people of Alaska. The people of Alaska are not saying that the government shouldn't get a share to run government uh, services. But what the people are saying, and I agree with them, is we don't have the royalty rights here in Alaska like other places do, like Texas or North Dakota or South Dakota. Um, and, and we want an opportunity to partake in this mineral production, this oil and gas production. Um, and so we're, we're just trying to get back to where we once were, where the PFD was not an issue. It wasn't a fight every year. But um, again, we're, we're hoping to be able to have discussions with the legislature this year to get a PFD that the people of Alaska expect, especially under these conditions. And so right now, we believe we have the, uh, the, the funding to do it, the uh, revenue to do it. And so that, once again, I know some people get tired of hearing it, but if, if I'm not going to fight for the people of Alaska, to be perfectly honest with you, I don't know who is. And, um, you know, we've got some legislators that absolutely are fighting with me on this issue. But sadly, we've got some that believe that government needs to get more money at the expense of the people of Alaska. And I simply don't agree with that. Right. And then, you know, we, we do have, I'm going to name names, you know, we do have some legislators like Bert Stedman who just want the government to control all of that money and don't really want it out to the people of Alaska. And of course, you know, he's, he's losing support because it's obvious that there, we now have a surplus. We've been through some, some tough times for several years with our prices going down. Our prices are now going up. It looks like they're going to stay up for a while. And it's always a good reminder of prices that can go up can go down. But do you think you can get a 50-50 plan past this particular legislature? Or are we going to have to wait until we uh, to change out some of these people? That's a great question. I hope we can this year. If not, the people of Alaska are going to have to make a decision uh, going into the elections, obviously. But um, there's no reason why we can't. There's no reason why we can't send to the people of Alaska a constitutional amendment for them to be part of the uh, solution of this problem. I believe the people of Alaska uh, would vote on a constitutional amendment in, in the positive uh, to, to get this issue off the table. So then we can focus on things like public safety and better educational outcomes for our kids and economic opportunities for all Alaskans. And so um, we've put solutions on the table, lots of solutions. Uh, we, we believe that those are opportunities for the legislature to take a look at and they come up with a solution to this, uh, this, this problem we've been wrestling with um, ever since, uh, um, the, uh, the previous administration uh, vetoed the PFD. And so we're going to continue to um, work with the legislature, but if it doesn't work out this year, uh, the people of Alaska are going to have to decide who they're going to send to Juno in the future to fix this problem. True that. Well, I really appreciate you being on our show today. And Scott and I are so grateful for all you do for Alaska. And I want to wish you and, and First Lady Rose, your daughters, a very, very Merry Christmas. I hope that it is um, you know, peaceful out there on the ranch and that, it, um, that the state stays uh, stable while we have Christmas and there are no more earthquakes and no disasters. Um, wishing you a very, very happy new year. So thank you for being on our show and hope you come back. Oh, we'll be back. And I want to wish everyone a, a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And just want to remind folks that uh, things are looking you know, up for Alaska. Like I said, our fiscals are doing well. Our crime rates are down. Our oil production is up. We've got folks looking at investing in the state of Alaska. Our budget balances this year. We got a $1.6 billion deficit when we came in. You know, I will, I'll say another thing, Suzanne. We're one of only two states in the country that have actually have a lower budget today than when I first came into office. Our budget today is a, a state spend is 7% lower than what it was when it was when I came into office. 
The only other state that comes uh, near that is Oklahoma. All the other states have increased their budget. So we've been able to do a number of things as well as continue to fight back on the vaccine mandates with other states. We've helped lead with that process. And so I think we have a lot to look forward to. We're going to a holiday season. Um, and I think Alaska is positioned well. And I think we've got a really great state and a, a, a quality of life that I think a lot of folks would envy if they, uh, if they spent some time here in the great state of Alaska. So thank you. Uh, well, you, you, you bet. And hopefully they will. I mean, I think the tourism season is coming back. And next time you're on the show, we're going to talk about that because it's super important to the entire, uh, from Fairbanks all the way down to Ketchikan. So thanks everybody for being on the show. Thank you, Scott, for being the co-host. Merry Christmas to you, Scott. And I'll see y'all on Monday. We will do a show on Monday. I don't know that we'll, we won't be doing a show on, on Friday on Christmas Eve, will we, Scott? Uh, there might be a pre-recorded one out. I might do. Oh, I might do something. I might do oh, a little something. Aren't you the yeah. clever one? Very good. Yeah. Well, it was really nice to have. I think. I think the governor just checked off. So should we talk about him now, or we just let it go? Uh, I think he. he <laughs> hey, listen. He. I think he articulated a lot of great points, and it's always good to remind ourselves that Alaska is actually looking up, and all it's the really things looking we talked good. about. Yeah, yeah, trending up. Low crime, high oil production. Um, you know, it's going to get those ports fixed. Absolutely. That's a huge deal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's, so. he's got the university working on drone on drone technology, and that, that's going to be really exciting. That's going to bring a lot of interest to our state if we can get that going. That'll, Jobs that'll... and money. Jobs and money. That's that's a big deal. All right. Well, that's what I wish for you for Christmas. Jobs and money and peace uh, <laughs> peace in the land, okay? You too. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody.